in a community like yours and everybody else's, people are really willing to share what um, their great great grandparents remember. And I think that's a real sort of something that we should really cherish and not lose um, as we go forward. Because I think someone very wise said to me once, it's yeah, it, it is about technology and moving with the times, but it's very important to learn the lessons of the past, not to make the mistakes and not keep reinventing the wheel, I suppose. So um, so we're looking really pretty there at Don Manor and all that land in front of it would have been again meadows. So looking up the Clareman Valley we are now and uh, so we're looking up towards the Mount Quilt Estate really, sort of the richer river bottom of the valley, Clareman River running down to meet the River Ellen. And you can see all the little patchwork of fields and uh, sometimes people get quite cross, there's not enough meadows and there's not enough trees in the landscape, but they were, but they were flooded. So, you know, the landscape is formed by glaciation and that has dictated how man and nature has lived in that state, really, that catchment or, or whatever. You can see there's people out, um, some livestock there, looks like there's maybe even hay or some crop rolled up in these fields. There are, this is a little chapel uh, that was flooded under the water as well and it looks like they're starting to move in and um, start to make changes in the building of the dams. And again, I just wanted to try and find some history photos, and I know some of you have got those to share. So this is a little bit later on. The Royal Tower is there. We're on the other side of it, looking up the valley towards Comellan and that estate. And there's Henbrun in the background. So Henbrun is my neighbor. And you can see to the right, uh, of his fields there, and most of those are hay meadows still today, and in fact some of those are triple SI, so they're sites of special scientific interest, um, so that's something that's, that's still there. So um, it is a landscape that inspired poets and artists uh, way back before there were reservoirs. So we had people like William Lyles Bowles, who stayed at Comellan, which I like to say it isn't Comellan, because a lot of people seem to be saying that at the minute, it's Comellan, and that's also proven by the fact that in, you know, in his time, that's how he spells it in his sort of anglicised way. And uh, he came to say it at Comellan House, and he was obviously um, inspired to write. And it's beautiful, and I, I feel really sort of quite, um, struck by that poem because if you know the Ellen Valley at any time in its history you almost know the places where he's talking about or even if when the reservoirs drop you know the places where he's been and again you know he describes the landscape it's quite a long poem google it I would uh, and I think you'd be quite smitten by it but it talks about the clover talks about the corn so there's a corn mill in the Ellen Valley as well and it just, it just really captures it. And of course, everybody's more familiar with uh, Percy the Shelley that stayed in the Ellen Valley. And uh, even he describes meadows whose green and spangled breast these fevered limbs have often pressed. So he was connecting to the landscape. So that's why people still connect to it today. It really, you know, it almost makes like tingles go down the back of my spine just thinking. That they were seeing things that anybody that lives or is part of the Earth Valley knows. Um, it's in your sort of in your soul, really. So this is looking before the dams. Some sketches were done, and uh, you wouldn't see that now. There's a cabin dam crosses the front of it, and again, it's just looking at that um, rugged, wild um, valley itself, and then um, Turner. This is supposed to be a sketch somewhere around Canook. So he was a artist to sort of drawing the landscape. So I've given you a bit of a painting of it. I've come back to Troy from Drive. So this is where we're at. This is the foot of the thorny bank. And uh, it's quite a vivid picture, but it does show quite nicely um, the hay meadows, which look really vivid green. But they're not improved or anything. It's just a saturation on the photograph. And there's hay meadows down here. And they're surrounded with all that brown and orange stuff that many people might have drained. But in Radnorshire, we seem to be quite fond of our Ross pastures. And um, 
and that's what it is. So when the meadows are cut from a wildlife point of view, just because it's all well ended in, it's not being designed by man, it's just man working with what he's got, um, the wildlife has somewhere to retreat to, but also it's a useful place that we might have put maybe cattle on. And then going back to the tide maps, when I was looking at the names of some of the field, there's a more modern barn here, and they would never have been allowed to knock it down today. It dated back to the 1600s at least. And um, it was called Kaikai, which means milk, doesn't it? So it's already an association with cattle. And there's a little field that goes up there that's called Kaikai. So again, we start the calves field. So again, I'm starting to think that Trudra had a big connection with cattle within its little holding. Of course, it looks quite big now, but it was actually three other farms, and two of those have been drowned under the water, so we've gained what's left for them. And one of the really nice meadows belong to one of the, the houses that's just underneath, just to the right of the picture here. Um, and then looking at that same map, and standing down there, I know some of you have been out to the meadow, um, one of those fields was called Dolly Bont. So that was flowers of the bridge. So you can imagine what ran on from our hay meadow down, you know, towards what would have been the River Ellen originally. Um, and again, coming back to field names, uh, you, many of you probably know that uh, when you're farming, you might have a little sort of field next to the house, a little flock or somewhere that's really handy to keep an eye on things. You might have your tiddly lambs go in there to so keep an eye on them. You might have the, the horse or you might have sort of a sick animal and you put it in here. It's a field that's not always used. Um, and that tended to be a field that would be quite perf rich. Um, things would graze around this field. So it got its name of Kyle Butty, which is hospital field. And that was a benefit because back then people remembered what uses the herbs were in that hay crop that maybe we've lost a little bit in today in chasing maybe more sugar rich fast growing mechanisms for our livestock, we've maybe neglected some of the other qualities that you get in hay. I use this picture to remind me that uh, I think one of the reasons I end up doing talks like this is that I always feel quite sort of um, hurt by George Hornbyard sort of saying that the Cambria Mountains is just a vaguely uninteresting place, you know, with millennia, but it looks drab and it looks quiet this time of year. But then come now, April, this whole landscape erupts into it, like sleeps in the winter, and it includes the hay meadows and the meadow pipits, the curlew have just come in, the house martins will be soon. So it's, it's a landscape you can very easily forget all its, um, you know, the depths to it. So going back again, so where we farm down to sort of Penigaric Reservoir, if you were to look across it down to the dam, uh, before the dams were built, this would be looking down to um, sort of towards Penigaric Farm. And again, you can see there was like little hedgerows and they're starting to become some building of the railway, I should think. And there are some old photos of the hay meadows running down, there's a chap there with his wheelbarrow and um, sitting in the field having his lunch uh, before. Uh, so these are like these grasses, I think they've been around a long time. We have this snapshot of since the dams, but they've been around a lot longer indeed. So um, I suppose we do know they're declining so much, and I think it's quite a shame that Welsh government, in their quest to fulfil um, sort of carbon and chasing that. Um, is neglecting how important our grasslands are for carbon storage and for wildlife. So hopefully that message will get through because yes, woodlands are important and so are peatlands, but so are these species rich habitats uh, in our landscape. So a little sort of journey through the hay meadow, and I usually do a few events if you actually really want to see uh, the hay meadow itself in usually late June, uh, beginning of July. And the unusual thing about our hay meadows, I suppose, is they're classed as lowland hay meadows, but they're not because they have species that you don't get in the lowlands. So they're actually sort of um, upland fringe hay meadows, but they've not had their own classification. And they're more similar to hay meadows that you might get up in Yorkshire and places like that. 
And one of the species that you'll find in the Elmai hay meadow is the bluebell. So once the hay has been cut up, shut off, and the fields to let the flowers grow, bluebells will be one of the lovely colours you see. And the other thing you'll see is all like a nice white spread of pigment. Um, these are both sort of characteristics of woodlands, I suppose, when they were cleared. And then as everybody sort of knows, the, um, the meadow maker, as they all call it now, is the hay rattle. So that would have been, everything is prescriptions now, but that would have been the plant that people listened to when they knew how to do that in the past. When it rattled, the seeds were dry inside it, and it has a little sort of purse. And that would be saying, it's time to cut. The hay is now finished, the flowers have done their thing. Um, we're supposed to cut our hay round about sort of July the 19th, the first date, but we live in the upland and you know we very rarely get really hot weather unless it was like last summer, which was really nice. So um, it does make getting the hay tricky. So the meadows do tend to get left into August, uh, maybe even into September in a bad year. But again, that sort of favours different flowers that will seed differently and different insects will be using some of those flowers. And then another little nice flower that we get um, in the Emma Valley that I really like is the meadow thistle. Um, and that's in sort of the damper patches. So you have the drier bits of the meadow, stony bits of meadow where the rocks are, and then we have some of the damper areas. And I, people often see a field as just a field, but anybody that has any land or a bit of their own garden realizes it different from one bit to another, so I think that's what makes it all quite magical. And if you walk into our hay meadow, you think, oh, lovely. If you walk into all the other hay meadows the other farmers have, you still be thinking, oh my god, it's lovely. And each one, even though they're in the same landscape, is like a completely different world, completely different flowers. Uh, you just get a different feeling from them. I'll show you some pictures of those. And of course, this is a lovely little plant. This is called sawwort, another one of my favourites. Uh, really popular with with insects, uh, likes the sort of margin, so it doesn't tend to be mostly in the hay crop itself. And then we've got uh, greater burnet, which is a flower that we used to use to stem sort of bleeding and stuff. Um, so people would have used a lot of the herbs in the meadow for particular ailments as well. Um, someone said to me that in the war, I can't remember what flower it is now, but they used to eat flour because it would stop people wanting to be hungry. So it would suppress hunger when they didn't have so much food. So I just thought that was really quite interesting. It is one of the meadow plants that we have there. So that's the little pigment I was talking about. And then obviously you important for hover flies and things that are around. So I just tried to take photos over the year. Uh, I, I, I keep realising, I have to say this every time, well there's another one of my favourites because it's just like that. So if someone had to nail me down on a favourite say, bird that comes back in spring or, or a flower, I, I just, it just changes since every week I walk in. And I say that you know, to people, if, if you have a meadow or you, or you know of a meadow, you go in every week and it just changes its colours. You, know, you go in, it's blue and it's white. Or, you know, and then it turns into like a, a buttercup meadow, so it's a different yellow, and then it'll turn into sort of the hog bits, and that's a little bit more of a, a lemon yellow, and then it'll change into maybe the, the burnet and the, and the sort of uh, knackweeds, and it's like purple. So it's never the same, no day, no same day in a meadow, you know. So this one is globe flower, and this is biodiversity action plant species of importance. We're on the right on the southern end of its um, range. It's quite common in places maybe like Scotland where it grows freely within a lot of meadows. In our meadow it's restricted to the edge uh, and a few other places where I've managed to get it established. It can be about this size, especially when it first comes up, but in the flush that it's been, it's been there so long that it's about this size and the globes are huge. So it's quite rare, but actually there's a fly, a tiny little thing that some of people came out to look at, and it's even rarer than the globe flower. So, um, yeah, really pretty uh, species. And then, of course, we come to the orchids then. So it's really nice to be able to, to, be able to say that you've got orchids still remaining in your meadow. Of course, orchids like 
conditions that aren't enriched particularly. Um, and I know often, you know, when there was encouragement for people to um, be more efficient in managing their grasslands, uh, efficient in that way where we need to get maximum from it, like I said before, we've lost maybe some of that diversity and not appreciated that and it's harder to get it back, I think. And that must frustrate some people who've done exactly what's been asked of them, done a real good job, and then someone's saying, yeah, but you won't get that now. And of course, I, I, I do feel a bit of a grief for people uh, in that situation, you know, they've, they've done, you know, trying to reverse some of it. But, you know, with projects like this, where you can get seed from various places, you can start to get um, your meadows restarted. And, um, of course, meadows are cut once a year, which makes it a little bit more acceptable for species like curlew and meadow pipits and, and things around. So this is a butterfly orchid. It's a greater butterfly orchid um, because it's got the sort of butterflies' wings that spread out. It probably should be more called a moth orchid because uh, it emits its smell at night, so it's like more attractive to moth than it is the butterflies. But uh, so it can be quite big. I mean. We get it about this side. When I went to the botanical gardens, it was this side, you know, it was so it, you know, it obviously adapts to its um, to where it is, so there it is a bit closer up. And we do have on the estate over at Pengarig, um, lesser butterfly orchid, which is a real rarity. And again, just looking again to talk about the, the differences, these are the hawk bits, little sort of dandelion looking flowers that attract um, bees and uh, the little bugs. And in the mix of it is um, the bitter vetch, which I think I've got a photo of. <coughs> and another lovely flower. So you get this in, I think, in Ramshire and probably, yeah, I think, sort of growing up towards Montgomeryshire in sort of hedgerow situations. It's a beautiful little tufted looking cushion of pink and purple flowers, really, and come about sort of four or five o'clock in the evening, it must really just start to give off its smell because it's, it's almost moving with bees in and out of it. Um, and again, this is one of our biodiversity action plan species, so a species that's quite important for, for our powers. And there's a little bit of it closer up, just showing how, how delicate. And it only sort of flowers maybe two or three weeks in its glory and then it's gone. Early on in the season, it's a cuckoo flower, so that will be something coming up soon. We don't have a lot of it in the Yellow Valley. Um, I think it sort of likes the sort of edges in, in places. But for one year, there seemed to be a real influx of it. And then, of course, with the cuckoo flower, we get the orange tip butterfly, which is quite pretty. And then we get sort of species like the wood anemones, <coughs> which are obviously a call back to the, um, the woodland time of its life. Uh, and then there's a little celadine, I think, just at the bottom there as well. So the first stage is meadow, so that's like an introduction to its, some of its flowers, uh, but of course, depending on those flowers, as I said before, there's this whole pyramid of everything depending on everything else. Um, we have the bees, and we have a mother ship to moth, rather the wet edges, we have the damselflies, the dragonflies, burnet moths, and then this one is a drinker moth, which is one of my favorite moths. And there's loads of people that hate hey, moths, don't talk about moths, but uh, I sort of quite like mammals particularly. He reminds me of something because he's quite furry and, and he's quite big. Um, and he, he's orange and maybe he's not quite so glamorous as the one up there. But the caterpillars for the drinker moth are one of the main food sources for the cuckoo when they come in. So again, for moth. Quite important in the whole scheme of things. And then we discovered something called a double line, that's quite a, a rarity as well. And then the little one that was described by Lee Bunchett, Are You Right? in her poem. Um, beautiful, pretty little flower. There's, about, there's quite a few varieties that are really difficult to tell apart, but basically they've got like little, they look like little eyes inside them. And they used to use it, I think Liz Earl still makes a little tonic that you put on your eyes to help sort of take the puffiness out so its name suggests what it was used for. So we still do use plants. And when Ray Woods, who is a quite a well-known botanist, came into our meadow, like he would look at the flowers and he said, 
it's not just a medal because it's great for bees and it's rare and stuff, it's because it's got all this genetic diversity of plants that are important to us as people. So whilst we're busy developing grasses that are great for agriculture, you know, if we lose everything, we don't have anything to come back to in the future. So diversity-wise, it's important levels that we don't even you know, I never even considered uh, useful before. So there's two quick frisky bird that pops in the, in the meadow. And then uh, back to the moth. So this one's a hop and a hawk moth, and that's a great one. Kids love that one. It's quite a big, beautiful moth. And then this was some red starts that we had one year. I could just watch it going from its box into the hay meadow, picking up its food, coming straight back, stopping by the fence, and then into its nest. So that like hay meadow was so important. And, I, and you know when you read the books, but when you're actually out there and you're seeing it happening, I don't know, it just it just makes such a big <coughs> difference. And then there's loads of the butterflies that are associated with it. Uh, so we've got the common blooms and our copper, and uh, we've got scabious which is often on the rossy edges of the hay meadow in the damper areas. And that's just a, just a hold in all the, uh, the wildlife. And it's a later one, so once the meadow's been cut, it's already getting going again. So. And the other thing I've sort of been looking at a bit this year is a beautiful little butterfly called small purple artillery. And it feeds in the hay meadows, although it, its food plant is a tiny marsh violet and it's in sort of the damper areas, but it needs the hay meadows for that nectar source, and having those two habitats together. I mean, this is a species that is declining in the UK. Wales is sort of holding its own, but we know the story, don't we? We've seen things like marsh um, artillery and stuff disappearing, and of course, we did want some marsh artillery in, in the catchment, so they're quite a nice little species to point out to people don't really see the beauty in a drink of all quite the same <laughs> that they would. And then these are the you know the little uh, beetles that are fluttering around and um, smelling everything with his antennae um, crop chambers and seeing the butterfly orchids. We have had owls, barn owls. Remember when I first came to the Ellen Valley one of my colleagues said you don't get barn owls in the Ellen Valley, it's too wet. And of course barn owls don't fly particularly in the, in the wet. But they do do quite well in there. I mean, they are more prone to it, but they'd be prone anywhere else in the UK when it's wet. And it, it was a bad year the year before last, but there were a couple of our hands nearby that did rare some chicks, so they seem to be back on the up again. And painted ladies, and back to my favourite salt water game. And then um, some of our summer visitors that depend on it. And then we get the swallows and the house martins, and swallow numbers are declining a good bit at the minute. And I definitely think in bringing in the cattle again on the farm, I, by the house you can see all the house martins in their little nests. And when the cattle are on the nearby fields, um, just next to the hay meadows, you can see them coming down in the evenings over the dung where the old flies are coming up and feeding. Um, so I think. Um, Again, maybe it's that bringing back of cattle, pike, ploy, and that sort of heritage that belongs on that landscape. Um, it just feels sort of right, really. And of course, then we have the cattle to feed the hay to in the winter. So that's the important thing about stock, about having you know, hay meadows are beneficial to your stock. And I probably didn't say that there was one farm up in the Fairman Valley, Penglin Island. And when I first came to the Elm Valley, it was like, fields, the hay meadows were there, and right all around it was conical woodlands where land was taken up from a lot of the farms uh, in the 1950s and stuff after the war to plant timber, you know, for the, the war, for the future and stuff like that. And the, they wanted to plant all those hay meadows, and the farmer's wife was there at the time because the hay was so important <coughs> to those, you know, it's extreme in the uplands in the winter. She fought, fought, fought for her hay meadows. And today those are our, um, sort of coronation meadows for Madonshire. So if she, she people forget her voice, but if she hadn't stood up for it, they wouldn't be there, they would be coming for woods today. So that's championing uh, what she did really. And this, this is the medical bit, so it's stuff there, that hidden card in the museum, but uh, it's quite nice just to see, see them like that really. And again, the 
applied wagtails that just come in this week, and again they're around where the cattle are, so they're picking off the bits that are in the poo and around the stuff. Uh, so that definitely there's been association when they come in. Oh, we're too much on the management, but for the Ellen Valley, we've shut off the hay fields on the first of March, uh, first of May, and. Um, we attend, you know, there's stock on it now, so they are grazed quite low. And I think what that does, it suppresses maybe the more rigorous grasses, and that allows some of the, the flowers to get away. But obviously if you graze a little bit late, you might nibble the top of bits of the flowers, but they tend to be quite robust. Last year they were off, maybe two weeks earlier, the sheep, and uh, some years they're a little bit later. Um, but uh, it, it seems to, it works for us. And then we have this lovely time where you just feel like it's a forever a summer because the flowers are growing and you leave the ground, you give the ground rest really, it's got no stock on it, so from a stock management point of view, they've now moved up to the hills mostly and the land is given back. And that is a really old sort of, it feels like a really old pastoral system where if you look at many of the farms, they have like a hill bank and your in by land is below it, because they didn't have fences uh, originally. Then you'd have your bank, and then you'd have your upland. And in your in by, you would be growing your corn and your oats in Radnorshire particularly, um, which you would feed to the cattle, and, and they didn't have bread uh, sort of, you know, earlier on, they were making oat cakes mostly. And then, so everything had to stay above this bank, and you would have shepherd things up and out of the way whilst you left the land, and then you took the harvest. Then the cattle would come back in and stock, and then there would be a process of maybe they'd be in the building or at least on the land where they would maybe be bringing the nutrients back to it. So there was this constant sort of moving. And um, I did have a talk and took some people out in the meadow. And I said that I've noticed in the Ellen Valley there was a lot of barns at the top of the hay meadows. I've been a bit lazy, I was saying, well, wouldn't it be easy just to gather all the hay down into it, you know? And they said, no, they said, what, what it is, they would take the hay up into the meadows where the, maybe the livestock would be, you'd be milking your cows, or you'd have oxen or whatever. You'd feed them over the winter, and you'd have their down and their mixing, maybe nearby, and then come sort of April or, you know, before you would lock up the land again, you'd be putting that muck back on the meadows. So there's this sort of cycle of repair, of course, we realise that's quite important for birds like the venusel and the curlew because the muck going back into the soil as organic muck is great for things like the earthworms and for the soil and for all the things that's going on underneath that we don't always think about. So you see a pretty flower but it's actually saying a lot more about what's going on underneath. And then of course I said to you a bit about us uh, harvesting it. So some pictures. Um, so Taking hay out, obviously they're very important in the in the winter time, um, and we're doing that sort of now with the yolks coming up to sort of lambing time. And uh, these are all pictures of Brian when he was just a boy, my husband, he was sitting up there with his dad, um, still sort of on the same field. And I, I'm not allowed in the track to do any cutting because they've done it in this way. They, and it, it's beautiful to watch. They do this sort of system, they know the feel, every, and it has to be done and they work it in. I couldn't do it. I'm allowed to drive it to help me go out and sort of get the hay itself in. But um, yeah, it's, it's something that's obviously passed on um, through the generations. And then there's some of our cattle, short one cattle, um, because we can keep them out a bit longer because they're quite hardy. And there we are, just to get a picture of this sort of mental map that he's got while he's going around and he's got no devices telling him to turn left or right. It's all just in there. So these are the main hay meadows below the road. And then this is quite a real species rich, wetter area. This is where you get the meadow thistle in that little damp patch there. And then this is last year, so the, they were dropping the water levels. Um, do some work, I think, I'll put it in here, but it was quite dry as well. Uh, people were walking across to the island up there. And uh, so we use tractors now, almost feel a bit ashamed because real hay making should be, as you were discussing before with science, that those lovely big pictures of communities coming together and, and uh, you know, having a feast at the end of it all. And we always have a harvest supper at 
the end of everything. And we, this is our biggest tractor yet. We can't get any bigger because it won't go through the barn anymore. <laughs> and of course, the land wouldn't really take it. So we're restricted by the topography, and the weather. Um, so when there was a chance for us to maybe think about putting on nutrients and making better what we were growing, that was done. I mean, we wouldn't want to tell the authorities, <laughs> but it was done. But it backfired because it weren't working with the natural cycle. And what happened is the hay went there, but the crop went woo, and it was up here. And the weather wasn't great, and we couldn't get, they couldn't get the crop. So they cut it, and they were just turning and turning and turning. Because of course, we're not supposed to have super massive this high. It's supposed to be herb rich. So that was never done again because, of course, now you are taking the risk of losing the whole crop. You're much better off taking what the land is going to give you. And uh, so it was a, a bit of a lesson. So we couldn't, and maybe that's one of the reasons why the Yellow Valley's like it is. There's a lot of people that say to me, oh, the Yellow Valley's like it is, it's rich in nature because it's all designated. And that's really not true. It's like what it is because it's the same people passing on stuff from generation and just live, like sort of almost living in that landscape, in a way of life, rather than trying to completely maximize, you know, what your profits are. We've got these little Welsh mountain sheep and they've been on the ship, the hills since the time of the Cistercian monks. They're pretty important themselves. Were you to stick anything else on the hill, they just would not thrive. So you have to live within your means. We don't want two lambs because we've got two to sell. We better one good big lamb, you know, and it's in a more natural cycle so the sheep are out on the hills. Um, mothers are very good and attentive and we actually have very little use to use medicines because things are out there they're not stuck and confined and catching things off each other um, we have issues on lamb and we have to go out and we have to shepherd them quite hard um, but we're not in sheds you know, we only bring in maybe the poorest that we see when we're out and I think the stock are better for that system in our uh, farming system anyway so, haymaking is a family thing, it used to be a community thing, so I've only got two kids, <laughs> but the dogs like to get involved. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's in there. And we have had family members up and they've helped out. And people love it, they really do. And then there's going into the barn, and what was it Brian says, the hay in the barn, there's like money in the bank, you know. And it's, your, it's your safety for the winter to come. Um, so this is our little baler. We've just bought a new one because the man came out to repair it last year and he was really, really in a bad state. Don't, don't go out in that. Don't, don't. Because apparently there's some arm in it that's going to fly out the side of the thing. And he says, please don't. And he managed to get it working. And in fact, that bale was the year it broke down and the bale is not being tied either. So there's a problem with the tying of the bit. So, um, Tony, our neighbour, came across and he baled up the hay in that last field. And as the hay was all baled up, the, the storm came in. And that's what Brian's mother's favourite thing was, you know, knowing the hay was safe in the barn when the rain then came. You know. So it was, it was at the edge. But uh, so yeah, so just sort of highlighting some of the meadows and all these, I think all these are triple S like status. So we have Ross and Hannah, but. That also includes Penny Garrig, really, uh, Penguin Island, Hedgebrook, Tinsidia, Trudegray, Hernand, and um, Abermore Island. Um, and that's just looking over Tony's, that earlier picture showing his hay meadows um, from a different angle, really, than you saw in a black and white photo. And there's Tinsidia, there's some of their meadows, again, surrounded by Ross in the open hill, last place where the reading ring was all found. This is Hermit Meadow, completely different now from any of the photos you've seen before. So these are some of the marsh orchids, and the rumour is somebody might have went to Aberystwyth, took their boots off with some sand on it, a few, but a few of these uh, marsh orchids turned up, and I've been counting them over maybe 20 years, and last year there were thousands, yeah. you know, so it's, uh, and again, completely different feel, very rich in sort of the dandelion, sort of forfeit type species. Um, not as species rich, but by no means any less important because it's in Pernod we found a rare 
B, called tornatil minor B, and we find out there's tons of fern and other really nice rare species. Um, uh, so it's a little bit close up to the, the orchid, like little lollipops. And then that's looking across, so fern and meadows are up there. And then he's got all this lovely Ross, and that's an SAC for its bird, birds, so that's a special area of conservation because it's got the last breeding pairs of curlew. And then, of course, Clyde has got cattle, which are key into most of these <coughs> wildlife things still thriving. This is some lovely hyenas that we had at the time, and they're great in some of the millennia because the sheep can't really deal with that tussocky grass, but the cattle are quite good at turning it over and managing the land. So, uh, again, I think it's to remind me that meadows are linked over the whole landscape on a lot of the wildlife. Uh, I mentioned about the coronation, this is a lovely picture of the coronation meadow. Completely different again from the photos. So this one's got oxide daisies, harebells and knapweeds. And that is one you can visit um, openly in, in sort of end of June, beginning of July. You just can stand on the track and just appreciate how beautiful it is. And that's the meadow that they take the seed from. The idea of it is to create new meadows. So um, I think maybe some of your project has had seed from there. Or that's to remind me to move on to sort of I'll quickly just go over this. It's like uh, 20 years ago, everybody would be saying, well, you need to put muck on a meadow. They used to line the meadows just to keep the um, acidity down. And, uh, but we weren't allowed to do that because they were so rare. People were always quite nervous to do anything to them because in case you spoil them. So they decided that they would set up some trials and they did this at Penigare and Penguin Island and a bit there at Hernand. And they put up these plots and they, they used different methods. They lined and mucked and mucked and left one on its own and they measured that flowering diversity and they were able to come up with what is the ideal amount that could be put on a meadow. But of course in the old days farmers just had the sustainable amount of, ca of cattle or of livestock to their land so there wasn't a need for that. But maybe these days we sort of we push the boundaries a bit more. So that's given us our limitations to how many tons per hectare we can put on but we don't really put anywhere near that anyway. So in some years it gets nothing. Um, so yeah that's sort of the the lands that were part of Troy de Drain and Lana Cleave and Teenant. Um, and this is sort of the fields and main meadows. There's another little one there. That's my clay meadow. That's the one that nobody can tell me what to do so I play in it because it gives me freedom outside restrictions to create something I feel better really, which it has had. And I've seen botanists come in and go, it's not as good as the ones over there. But if you walk into that little tiny plot, meadow, it's covered in clovers and eyebrights, um, maybe not as much diversity, all the butterfly orchids are starting to come now, we've lined it, um, but it's absolutely teeming with bees, it's probably the best of all of them for bees, it's just moving with them. So this was just sort of from a personal point of view, for years and years, I've, Brian's mum and dad hadn't lined it since they came in 1969, and I just kept asking the people that were going out serving it, is it okay? Do we need to do anything? Yeah, I think it's fine. And uh, with the Ellen Lynx project, uh, we managed to get some funding to go out and test the meadows. And they were indeed, some of them, losing some of their diversity um, because you know they, they were getting more acidic. So that was starting to impact it. And we lined them first time a uh, year before last, or the summer, or the, uh, the spring last year, maybe. And within, I mean, it could have been that it was a different summer, but I've never seen seven butterfly orchids in the one field, so I'm assuming it hasn't had any negative impact. Um, so, botanically, some of the plants were getting a little bit of trouble starting. Of course, I want, I want to be able to take people there and show them that you can farm, have <coughs> stock, and have biodiversity. I suppose that's the message that people can take away, and that all farming isn't crap, that it, it can be really good. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of people I meet, you know, people that have been maybe conventionally farming that have come along and said, I want to do something in the future. And I feel like I've done this and, I'm, so, you know, they're getting a bit older and they're thinking things maybe a bit differently. So that's been quite nice. So that's everything. That's all when the scientists come and they map 
it all into colours um, so we know exactly what, where and whatever. It's pretty and I, I do look at it a bit and again this was the, the sampling for Lyme tell us how, what the pH was and the potassium and magnesium and everything. And then that was my little map to them up at uh, Welsh Alford government to say where I would be the Lyme and then, of course, we didn't have fertiliser spreader because that had gone years ago because that wasn't much good. So, so we'd been going around with a, a scoop that came from the old sawmills from Nails, I think it was for, throwing lime in a wheelbarrow up and down the fields. So it was really in the old-fashioned way. Um, but up until then, I've been working on a, on a thing that somebody had come up with in the past to try and balance everything. I didn't want to lose anything on our watch, I suppose. Is a big thing. If I lose the glow flower, they'll be saying that first, and those people, there were glow flower there before they went. I want to be able to say well, we've got more um, from farming, just the way that farming in the Yellow Valley is supposed to be. So have the other farms. So I talk about me and our farm, but I'm actually talking about everybody across that landscape. So um, that got me involved with the Nature Friendly Farming Network, which is just promoting the good stuff that farmers are already doing and helping farmers think about other things that they might want to do. Um, and then quickly on to sort of the sort of wetter edges and that Ross pasture. So I already touch, uh, we have a very rare orchid called the fringe orchid that comes up in the closer grazed grasses. So there's not so much competition. Uh, we have the more common spotted orchids, uh, heat spotted orchids, and they line those wet areas at the edge of the field like tons of little lollipops, like you and Willy Wonka book or something. They're really lovely, and they're probably quite quite a lot of you will see those in, in your sort of fields along your land. There's our artillery. In the real wet places, we get sundew, which is an insectivorous plant, and then of course in the sort of streams, particularly in the uplands, but in our pond and stuff, we get things like the water bowl, which the key number seems to be 97% decline in most things. But the water bowl is quite special, and uh, they always associated it with um, canals and riverbanks, you know, all ratty. And then they discovered uh, maybe 20 years ago that in Scotland they were finding water bowls above 400 metres in some of the areas there. And when we looked at the Elm Valley, we were finding they were everywhere, so it's been made a national key area for water bowls. But there's a little fragrant orchid, really fragrant, smells really nice, like vanilla, and then we do have the old white specimen of it. That's a stunted spotted orchid. And there, that's what I was trying to say, they're like those are little lollipops. And then we get another one, Bog Asphodel, um, which used to be collected and turned into dye. For in Lancashire particularly, for the ladies' hair. They thought it was much more attractive, we really wanted. But they might use plants like that for dyeing wool. And um, when we used wool, um, you know, today it's gone out of fashion, literally, but it was very important. The little flower called lousewort, called lousewort because they believed it gives sheep wool and lice, but really because it was on these sort of wetter margins, the sheep didn't tend to do quite as well on them. Um, so it was more to do with that than then giving it to it, but it's an amazing little flower that uh, really attractive to bees. And then a few years ago, I found this little thing, and I looked at this little thing as in little like that, and looking down at me, that little, little white thing, like a little white orchid, I don't know what that is, so I looked at my book, and couldn't find it, and then eventually I found it, and it was a small white orchid. Um, <laughs> and they're only found, I think, the uh, Vicarage Meadows, where they've got a couple come up, and a couple of years ago it was the only uh, orchid in the whole of the UK popped up that year. So it's rare, more common up towards um, the Dales and that sort of area. So this has <coughs> popped up after years and years. So um, this thing is hiding out in our meadows. There's a bit of a, another year it came up again that look a bit sad really. It's only got a couple of flowers on it. But I did see insects go into it. And the first year it came up, I was like, oh my god, I've got this orchid. And, there's a list of people who want to see it now, but of course, I went down to see it one day and a slug had like. <laughs> <laughs> so I did get a little bit of copper piping, some friend said to me, and I put that on it now. I didn't put the picture, but I put it on it and that kept the, the slugs off, so bad my slugs. I mean, so yeah, 
there's nice stuff like White Beach Sedge, that's the Louse Ward, and uh, those are the, you know, the millennia ages, which are quite cool, for like the, the small mammals, for the barn owl and the birdies and everything. And this is uh, another sort of thing you get in the Athens. Uh, it is the Monticola, the bumblebee, probably the most common bumblebee in the hay meadows. Our meadow um, thistle, softer thistle. And then there's our uh, sundews, butter waters, another insectivorous plant that encourages insects in and lures them in, and it sucks their juices and moves into the wind. So yeah, so we just think we've got stuff like that in Wales. And then cotton grass, quite a sweet plant. Again, just going over some of our species again, I'll skip that one. And I think I said before, it's a living landscape. Such a bright work. And you see, he's got the camera and he's doing the work. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, just putting some uh, putting the posts in, and we're separating the Ross because it needs a bit of grazing in the summer, and that's had a massive impact for the house martins, the swallows, the cuckoo. I really think it's benefited it. And then the hay meadow, which is, see how short it is come April. I look at it every year and think, oh, God, we're going into oblivion. What are they going to say? And every year I go down and you know, just like deep in flowers, perfect. So that's the torment heel mighty I mentioned. Now that's a species that likes a bit of grazing, so often try and champion that sheep aren't always bad. That's a bat species. And then this is another little meadow across the road from the hay meadow by where we have our sort of uh, sorting pens. And uh, I took the wildlife trust down into the hay meadow and said, oh, it's lovely, oh, it's lovely. And then we went across the road where all the grazing was, and you could see them there's graze, and it's like, yeah, but it's absolutely covered in like a mini meadow. And we have to keep this meadow slightly grazed because it's got mountain pansies in it. And we bring so the sheep are in and out almost a bit like a Kaya's butty system, really. They come in maybe for shearing, then they go back out for a bit, and there won't be anything, maybe the cows will be on it. It's not really used with any prescription, only that we've left it a bit for the flowers now in the summer, and then we'll graze it quite hard, um, sort of September, October. That fits in with our farming system because then we're bringing the sheep off the hill anyway, because we're sorting them to go to tack or to be, you know, sorted the yams for the sales. So that sort of fits in with everything. But those are just beautiful harebells, clovers. Um, have found um, just a bit higher up the valley. We've got glowworms on the rocky bits. We've got sort of. Uh, Field scabious is, um, yeah, it's a red clover. Uh, and that is the little mountain pansy. And we just get the sort of yellow one, although Brian's mother does remember there being the yellow and purple, and we did have one yellow and purple. Um, but when I went to one of the other farms, just everywhere there were just all colours of wild mountain pansy, which need the grass school to be much shorter, otherwise they become um, covered and swamped. Lose them. And then across the sheep, well, everybody's busy bashing them. We've talked to a mycologist or a hungry person, and they will again be saying, Oh no, we need grazing livestock in, in the landscape. It's, it goes back to a long time. Come sort of autumn, the colour of the flowers then changes to a different colour, and it's the wax caps. And the wax caps are connected to those flowers. So they've got all, you know, we've seen it on the telly, all those mycelium that go underneath the ground and connect to different things. And the flowers use the, the fungi, and the fungi use the flowers, and everybody benefits. So we, we have had wax caps um, surveyed them recently because we were starting to realize how important they were. And the one field that you see all those little stunted flowers in, um, even though the triple SI below the road for its flowers, so it's got some nice flowers. Above the road, we've got species of wax gaps that are quite glamorous, but uh, they're internationally rare. I think we've got five or six of those. And uh, these are on the same list as your giant panda, your fengal, you know, tiger, and stuff like that, these wax gaps. So they're important, they're important globally, and they're important to Wales, and Wales and Scotland were some of the best places for these wax caps. So again, just to show you the variety, and we had a great girl up, and she was showing us, you know, how you identify some of them. And it takes a little bit of time, she's sniffing them and all sorts of things. But yeah, it's quite, it, once you get into seeing things on your land, it just brings you into
into another dimension. And these are the earth tongues. So we have to collect a few of those and send them off for DNA and stuff. And again, I think we have about four species of the earth tongues. Which you, again, you'd expect to find sort of the other places you get fungi like this would be maybe in your local churchyard or something where they cut the grass and things. And uh, that's because they would have once been meadows. Church lands were mostly sort of meadow lands. And again, I think owing themselves to, uh, you know, we can't talk about meadows in their own right, did they owe it to the livestock that depend on them and help them out and graze around them. And of course, for us, it's, it's traditional breeds. Um, that will happen soon. And again, that's just to illustrate, and this is probably one of my favourite pictures. It's not really a, technically a very good picture. The sun is going down behind the hill. And this, all these little flashes of lights and flecks of the sun catching in insects that are associated with cattle. And it just gives you visually this idea of how important stock can be in a landscape. So I'm sort of, you're probably hungry, so we'll come to an end. Thank you, anyway.